Hi Valley Life community and friends, welcome back to Midweek Connections. I'm glad that you could join us tonight from your living room or your bedroom or wherever you are. Um, we're going to have the lyrics to the songs on the screen today, so please just join us and um, let's worship together.
before you, and we ask that you would bless this message tonight, that you would anoint Pastor Lemons, Lord God, and that you would open our ears to hear your message. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening, friends. It's a delight to be back with you again. And uh, we're journeying through Paul's letter to the church at Rome. We've learned some very interesting things already. We've discussed the theme verse, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because it is the power of God unto salvation, even to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. So tonight, I want to pick up some more of this wonderful, wonderful book. And I will be reading to you from Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 26. They will form the basis for our re remarks tonight. It reads this way from the New International Version. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between the Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood. To be received by faith, he did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Christ Jesus. As I had mentioned to you, I will only deal with a few significant passages in our text, that is the epistle to Romans. If I were to deal with all of the epistle, it would take us the better part of a year or two and Further, we would have to deal with a lot of technical issues and controversies that will not help us on our journey through Romans. So we're going to pick up some of the high points in some of the scriptures. You'll pardon us if we don't quite get your exact scripture, but these are the ones who are important to us. By the way, we will be going all through this, and uh, perhaps afterwards we will be looking to the Gospel of John. The I Am's of Christ, there are at least seven of them, along with the seven miracles and so on. Pastor Alvarez has asked us to continue our studies and uh, be the teaching pastor, so we're going to do that. I hope that you will join us week after week, but particularly right now as we're going through this wonderful, wonderful letter to the Roman church. Now, last time I dealt with how the Apostle Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that the other side of the coin was... I am exceptionally grateful. I am exceedingly proud of the gospel, of the message, because the message is what sets people free, breaks the power of sin, breaks the power of all that holds us back, breaks the power of imprisonment for eternal damnation, and sets us free for all who believe. And so we want you to understand that the apostle is saying that God set all who believe free from eternal da damnation. And when Paul wrote this kind of thought, he did not say, God sets free from eternal damnation all those who keep the law. Or in modern terms, we would say, all those who do good deeds. This, of course, was a serious theological error or heresy according to those of the time who believed that keeping the law was how to be right with God. Putting a person right with God meant that you kept all of God's commands 
And some of the rabbis have said there are like 619 of them, including all the ritual laws, etc. By keeping all of those, you earn the right to God's heaven. And Paul did not say, for all those who keep the law. He said, for all those who believe under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, keeping the old covenant to a to degree was good, but it did not earn eternal life. Keeping the old covenant established by the lawgiver Moses seemed to teach that only those who practiced this, which meant all the rest of the world would be lost, except for those who were under the Old Testament or the Jewish covenant. So, Paul establishes right away that those who are right standing or acquitted before God were set free from eternal damnation, from that penalty, by faith. And by faith we are made right with God. Wow! For the time, and even now, this is a revolutionary or an astounding statement. How could this be? How could God himself, who said, the soul that sinneth shall surely die, let sinners go free? If he said they're going to die, and now he set them free, isn't he contradicting himself? Isn't he going against his own standards? He is not being righteous himself. He can be accused of doing wrong. But of course we know God does no wrong. So Romans demonstrates to us how God was righteous in setting the sinners free as a free gift. In fact, that's part of verse 17 of chapter 1. In it, in the gospel, God reveals his righteousness. So now I want to go to the text we read to you more specifically and deal with some of the implications there. Now you'll notice I'm using my text. I want to be careful to follow our thoughts as much as we can. There are several significant statements in the passage that we read to you. Uh, it's First of all, let me deal with this. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This is the summary sentence of what the Apostle Paul has declared in chapters 1 and 2 of the Roman epistle. He declares there in verses 18 through 32 of chapter 1 that all the people apart from the Jews were sinners. They were called Gentiles or Greeks or all the rest. From creation, these folks had begun to worship the creation itself and not the creator. They had begun to ultimately give loyalty to this world, reverence to the creation, and that led to disastrous results. You see, God had given himself to humanity. They knew him, but they turned against him and worshipped the creation instead. He talks about they made God look like images of animals and so on in verses 18 through 30. And it says... Three times, because of their sinful attitudes and uh, loyal worship of the creation, he turned them over to more sinful activity, more sinful life, loyalty, till ultimately they were living in debauchery and complete idolatry away from God. Almost as a shock, though, once the apostle in chapter 1 concluded that all Gentiles or the rest of the world were sinners, he says the same things about the Jewish folks. He says that they too are exceedingly sinful because of their behavior. They had the law, but they did not keep the law. They had the covenant. They had the temple. They had the scriptures. But in all of this, they missed God himself. They had the great advantages but they failed in personal relationship with God. They knew his word, but did not know him. They knew his ways, but did not know him. They had seen his glory and his presence, yet were not close to his heart. Paul shows that this thing is true, 
even by their own prophets and their own scriptures. He says this, quoting the Old Covenant, There is none righteous, no, not one. All have turned away. There is no one who understands, quoting Psalms and Isaiah and other writers of the Old Covenant. So then, in chapter 3, verse 23, the Apostle Paul concludes that all, all the Jews, all of the Gentiles, and that was what was considered the whole world, the whole world had sinned and were falling short of the glory of God. This clearly meant that all were lost. This would mean that no one, not a single one, would come to eternal life. No one would stand right before God when judgment day came. But then, again, almost as a lightning bolt, he changes his thoughts and Paul says, all are justified freely. Now he's just said, all are condemned. And then he says, all are justified freely. This is mind-blowing in, in some ways. To pronounce that all sinners were now justified, isn't that a contradiction in terms? How could sinners be justified? How could they be granted amnesty as a free gift? All are sinners? All are justified freely? This is spiritual nonsense. This is completely biblically and theologically, according to the Old Covenant, wrong. This just can't be. God can't be God and let the guilty go free. They must pay for their sins. The wrongdoer must be punished. Spiritual justice must be served by God himself or he is not, he is not God. But then the Apostle Paul goes on to explain these revolutionary startling statements. He says people were justified freely by his grace and now I want you to notice this phrase closely. Through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. The whole idea is that people were sinners and they were going to have to pay for their wrongdoing, but they were let go or they were bought. They were redeemed back to God because the punishment had been paid. The price of setting them free had been met. The penalty was given and now since the penalty had been paid, they are now acquitted. They could stand before God in eternity. This happened by God himself. God sent his only begotten son to take the place of sinners in punishment. God sent his only begotten son in, well, and to punish him instead of us who deserved eternal damnation. God, in fact, we may say, punished himself so that the sinner can be set free. My friends, this is grace. This is unmerited undeserved, unearned favor from God, from God's heart of love. He himself took our place by sending his own son to be punished. This is unlike any other religion or relationship in the world. This is a God kindness. This is a God goodness. This is a God favor that surpasses all other loves and all other systems God has redeemed and brought all sinners back to himself because the thing that separated us has been removed. Sin has been removed. The punishment has been paid. And now we have escaped the fires of eternal damnation. Back to the text. Paul goes on to tell us that this right standing is a free gift to all who believe. Now notice he says, all are sinners. All are set free. 
But not everyone is free. He qualifies the all by saying this, for everyone who believes. Lest anybody misunderstand, the apostle was not talking about a universalism where that all the creation and all the angelic hosts, even the devil and demons and all fair sinners would be brought back to God. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is that those who believe in what God has done for them will receive eternal life. The Gentiles who believe in God's Son, Christ Jesus, they will be set free. The Jews who have believed in Christ Jesus, they will be set free. They are made righteous by faith before God. And this is a great sub-theme of Paul's letter to the Roman church. Now I want to keep dealing with the text. So we go back to the text again in verse 25, which he says this, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his own blood to be received by faith. God presented Christ as a sacrificial atonement redeeming work. Okay, let me talk about that for a moment. Now many of us don't quite get the idea of an atoning sacrifice. It is probably best explained something like this, or at least illustrated like this. In the Old Covenant, under the Old Law, when a person sinned or wrong, had offended God or had broken one of those 619 rules, they had to make atonement for that. They had to pay the guilt for that. They had to do something to get that off of their sin record. So in the Old Testament, the idea was bring a goat or a bull or an ox, even a pigeon if you're very, very poor. Bring that animal to the priest. And then the person representing the family or himself would put their hand on the ox. And what this signified was that the sins of the presenter were being transferred to the beast. So then the priest would take the beast and sacrifice the beast, killing it, cutting its throat and shedding its blood, taking the blood and putting it on the altar. And by doing that, the animal died, was punished in the place of the presenter. So their sins were hidden. They were covered. They were kafar is the, what the ancient Hebrew word would mean. So then, the person who was guilty was no longer facing a punishment because the animal, the creature, had taken the punishment for him. Well, in like manner, God sent his only begotten son, and he suffered and died the sinner's punishment. He took our place. He was our substitute. He made a sacrifice for all of our failures, for all of our sins. Jesus Christ took our sins on himself. By believing in him, our sins are transferred to him, and his sacrifice takes away all of our sins. He paid the penalty. He substituted. He vicariously suffered for us that we might not suffer. So this means several kinds of things. His atoning work shows that this is really a God thing. No one could be free from their own wrong according to strict, true justice. But God made the exception. He paid the penalty for us. It means again, and I repeat, Christ died for us in our place, meaning we don't have to die. Since he died, we don't have to face an eternal death, an eternal damnation. We are free to face God without guilt, without shame, without wrong. And so God can accept us as a righteous God into his heaven. It means this. Everything was paid. Nothing else needs to be done 
in terms of paying for sin. It's not Jesus plus keeping the law. It's not believing in Jesus doing a lot of good deeds in modern terms. It's not having to knock on a lot of doors, giving a lot of money, living a great kind of life, being a charitable giver, uh, doing all kinds of deeds, plus Jesus. No. It's Jesus alone. When we put our faith, our trust in Christ alone, nothing else, then we will have eternal life. This was a sheer grace. This was a sheer love. This was completely unearned or deserved. And that's why they used the word agape, God's pity, God's love. He didn't get anything out of this that he needed. He loved us and wanted us. And so he paid the price. Now there's one other thing I want to say in this regard. Christ's atoning sacrifice was completed. But how are the benefits appropriated or received by us. And this is where he says to be received by faith. This is what he meant in Romans chapter 1, what he said, verse 16, to all who believe. This is what it means in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that whoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is what it means in John chapter 1, verse 14. To those who believed in him, he gave the right or the authority to become sons of God. This is what Paul meant later on in the book of Romans when he said, Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. Confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and you shall be saved. This is what he meant when he spoke to the Philippian jailer on that night when the earthquake set Paul and Silas free from that dungeon dark. The jailer said to them, what must I do to be saved? And the apostle answered one very short verse. Believe on the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved. So that is how this free gift of eternal life is received. Now, many years ago, uh, younger days, back in the days, they say, I used to play quite a bit of golf. I had a friend who uh, owned a, a driving company. That is, they would teach people how to drive, and they would have 20 or 30 people. In fact, those who had broken the law could go and, and not get it on their record and so on. And he was a good golfing friend. Well, he had bought some golf clubs that were just the state of the art. They were the best, very expensive. But for whatever reason, he actually did not like them. So we're playing golf one day, and he looked at me and said, Would you want these clubs? No, I didn't say, No, I wasn't too proud. I said, Sure. Well, he gave me those clubs, almost worth $1,000. Now, if I had a reach in my pocket and said, Well, here, let me give you some money, uh, 10 or 20 or something, he would have been insulted because, you see, he wanted to do something for me because we were friends, because he cared for me. He wanted to give freely. So, friends, God gives us eternal life freely. When we think that we can earn his favor, when we try to do something to gain God's favor, no, 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 that's an insult to God. We receive eternal life as a free gift. Do you believe? This is where we come to the end of our lesson for today. All have sinned. All in the ancient.